brand new Star Wars Rogue One trailer has landed, and despite the rumors of troubles stemming from extensive reshoots, it looks bloody great. So as always, let's get into the Easter eggs and things missed or whatever, including details on the new characters, such as K2SO and Bodhi Rook, a more dangerous Imperial army, the planet Jeddah, and the secrets behind it, Darth Vader's appearance, and who's likely to carry over from previous Star Wars films. It's never 10 things by the way, and you probably didn't miss all of them. It's just a thing I started calling these trailer breakdown videos, and here we are, wondering how long I can maintain this lie. And potential spoilers, even though it probably doesn't apply, but there it is. I said it. Let's kick things off with the Imperial side of things. Now whilst we'll be getting a lot of similar stuff to what we've seen in previous Star Wars films, this movie is going to expand on what we know. We get differing designs for ground assault vehicles. This is apparently an ATACT or something. New ships and soldiers, namely the Death Troopers. The difference between these and regular Stormtroopers is that they have a level of competence that a standard Stormtrooper somewhat lacks. <laughs> As far as the Rebels go, who are tasked with stealing the Death Star plans, I'm only going to talk about a couple, as I've touched upon them all in my previous Rogue One videos that I'll link at the end of this, including the Star Wars Celebration one, where Jiang Wen dropped a massive spoiler. It's pretty hilarious. But we see Saw Gerrera appear again, sporting his reshoot hair, where it was recently revealed that he needs a suit to survive in the same way that Darth Vader does. But more on him in a bit. The new droid, K2SO. K2SO? Uh, uh, Anyway, regardless, he's interesting. He shares C-3PO's love for spouting off statistics. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. There is a 97.6% chance of failure. But I think that's pretty much where the similarities end. He's a former Imperial Enforcer droid, reprogrammed and freed by Cassian Andor, who he has a deep loyalty to. I think he also has a hand in rescuing Jin Erso and Cassian in this scene, because we see them shackled, and then later there's just a pile of dead stormtroopers behind him. He also seems very reminiscent of Proxy from The Force Unleashed and HK-47 from Knights of the Old Republic. Conclusion. You have just shown me your soft, meatbag-like underbellies and said, HK-47, please shoot me repeatedly there until I die. It looks like in this moment we'll be getting a ship jumping to light speed from inside a planet's atmosphere. We actually got the opposite of that in The Force Awakens. Jiang Wen's Bay's Malbus mentions how the Imperials destroyed his home, and I wonder if he's referring to this as part or all of Jeddah might be being destroyed. Also, this guy... Where's his, where's his head? Is he just like a face on a chest? What's that about? But look, that's probably not, it's probably not important. I want to talk about the planet Jeddah, which acts as a kind of Jedi pilgrimage, in the same vein as, say, Jerusalem. Director Gareth Edwards has stated that there's something very important on Jeddah that serves both the Jedi and the Empire, and that it felt very much like something we could relate to in the real world. Okay, so there's been a lot of speculation about what this could be, but luckily, Donnie Yen just flat out told us that it's kyber crystals. Jeddah is the planet where they have these resources to build and make a lightsaber. To elaborate on that, they're the key component in a lightsaber that gives it its power. It's standard that part of a Jedi's training involves retrieving a crystal and then constructing their own saber. The reason the Imperials would be interested in these is because they also act as the power source for the Death Star. There's a canonical episode of Clone Wars that was never finished that involved Anakin and Obi-Wan stopping the retrieval of a giant kyber crystal that was apparently going to be used in a Separatist weapon, heavily implied to be the Death Star. Grievous hopes to gain possession of a massive kyber crystal, a weapon of unspeakable power. Bodhi Rook, who has an Imperial insignia, is said to work as a pilot for the Empire, but it's more to kind of get by, you know, just pay the bills and whatnot. And we see a number of ships taxiing on and off Jeddah. Perhaps he flies one of these and his job is to just haul kyber crystals. This structure here, which we see in a number of shots, looks like it could be some kind of Jedi temple and might be the key reason behind the Imperial occupation. The Emperor and Darth Vader's key objective, aside from hunting down and destroying the Jedi, has been to find these sites and either destroy or exploit any of the materials or knowledge that they hold. And this is something that we have seen in Star Wars Rebels. So basically, I think there's two parts to the Rebellion mission. Stop the Imperials from acquiring the crystals necessary to complete the Death Star, and when that fails, because... I mean, it would have to at some point steal the plans in order to exploit the space station's design flaw. I mean, it has a number of design flaws. The big gaping hole in it is really just one of them. So anyway, I says forget the dental plan, forget sick leave. I just want a railing. 
You know, one railing, right here. A major part of this movie, I believe, takes place on a new planet called Scarif, which acts as the planet the Death Star orbits during its construction, similar to the way the second Death Star was tied to Endor. The shot of Jyn Erso up high, I believe is her attempting to transmit the Death Star plans to the Tantive IV, which gets boarded by the Imperials in a frantic attempt to retrieve the plans. We get what I think is her carrying the schematic in the footage shown at Star Wars Celebration. But let's talk about the return of Darth Vader. This trailer shows us very little. I mean, what do you need to see at this point anyway? Everyone knows what he looks like, even with his helmet off. Looks like a bloody egg, this bloke. I'm hoping, and I can't imagine that we'd be getting Vader if this didn't happen, that he actually does something. Unlike the last time he appeared in live action, where he just walked for a bit and then he, and he crossed his arms. But I want to get stuck into the returning Star Wars characters. Yes, there will be a massive focus on the new players in the universe, but seeing as this is set in a time after Revenge of the Sith and before A New Hope, which makes it technically a prequel. Hashtag Rogue One is a prequel. Never forget it. That's what it is. Why don't we touch on some familiar faces, starting with the obvious choice, Darth Vader. One of the closest versions of Vader that we've seen to this, other than when he appears in A New Hope, is from Star Wars Rebels. So Anakin. And what that showed us was that any semblance of the man seen from the prequel trilogy is gone. And can I just say, thank God. At least with Vader, you know where you stand. This guy, I mean, is he going to cry or remove your head? Who knows? Now, it's probably just an indication of the era the first film was made, but the Vader in A New Hope is incredibly slow. Again, that could just be put down to being a byproduct of 70s filmmaking, but he's faster both before and after this movie. I think there's a chance that he receives extensive injuries in Rogue One that he's still reeling from, seeing as the next movie in continuity picks up directly after this. And if anything, it would be a neat way to explain explain the clunkiness of this sword fight. Mon Mothma is back, last seen in Return of the Jedi, but she also appears in a deleted scene from Revenge of the Sith, played by the same actor. She's one of the instigators of the Rebellion, and acted as a kind of mentor for Princess Leia. So this whole bringing down the Empire thing, that's something she's been a part of for 20 or so years. Another returning character, but from the Clone Wars animated series, is Saw Gerrera. He fought for the Republic during the Clone Wars, and then with the rise of the Empire, led a group called the Partisans against them that used more extreme tactics than most Rebellion cells. The character wasn't always to be Saw Gerrera either, but it turns out that he fitted the role perfectly. The way that came about is as the Rogue One story started to gel, the filmmakers realized that they needed a, a rebel extremist type character, and we already had one in Saw. They took that character, ran with it, and as they started developing the script, they realized there was only one person that they wanted to play this character. Bail Organa, the adoptive father of Princess Leia, also appears. He was actually first seen in the footage shown at this year's Star Wars celebration, played again by Jimmy Smits. And his most noticeable contribution to the franchise is watching a child get shot to death and then flying away. So, you know, hopefully he's back on Alderaan when it explodes. Of course, there's plenty of other characters that could return. Han Solo was rumoured to show up, but that was nixed by director Gareth Edwards. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do this, but I think I should. Uh, I can put to bed Han Solo's not in the movie. That's not to say he definitely won't appear. Things could very well change, but you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bank on it. Plus, it's too close to a new hope. It'd be weird if he's this, and then a few days later, He's this. That's like when they replaced Edward Norton with Mark Ruffalo. Even though Ruffalo's great, it's kind of jarring. Or when Uncle Jesse was replaced with an even more handsome Uncle Jesse. I mean, there's a good chance that it'll be referenced, you know, like a casual Han Solo mention. Or, you know, we see the Millennium Falcon or Chewie or something. Something! You know, or nothing. Boba Fett is banging around this timeline also. He's more likely going to show up in the Han Solo solo movie. He's all about working for the Empire. They love him, even if they have vastly different opinions regarding disintegrations. Who else? Uh, Admiral Akbar. Wait, is his name Gil Akbar? Ah, oh, everything I've ever known is a lie. I feel like I've been tricked or I've walked into a situation I was thoroughly unprepared for and a surprising event unfolded right in front of my eyes. Maybe we could turn to Gil Akbar himself to adequately describe the situation. We have enemy ships in sector 47. Yeah, so he has a hand in the evacuation of Yavin 4 after the destruction of the Death Star. So he's, you know, somewhere close doing something. Unfortunately, the actor who voiced him passed away in April. But, you know, that's not to say we won't see him. Obi-Wan is alive, but nah. He's like 100% Alec Guinness at this point and stuck on Tatooine. That's not to say he didn't leave the planet for his entire exile, but again, it's too close to a new hope. Plus, the next time we see him, we'll probably be in that Obi-Wan solo movie that hasn't been announced. But Disney, if you're watching this, and I know you're not, you should probably make that movie. It'll, it'll be a good one. I'd also love to see some other powerful Imperial figureheads, namely Emperor Sheev Palpatine and Grand Moff Will Huff Tarkin. What are they given 
these guys' first names for? Just leave it! Leave it alone! It's weird! Now, the Emperor, that's an easy get. Ian McDermott is like the perfect age to step back into the role. Plus, he's great at it, even in not-so-great movies. Peter Cushing, though, passed away in 1994. But rumours circulated that a massive amount of the budget was being dedicated to recreating him using CGI. But the wrinkle in the whole process, so we're told, was that no shots of Peter Cushing's legs exist from the, the original movie. What an absolute... Horseshit story. First of all, the legs thing isn't actually true. Here's a shot of his legs. Also, I'm not doubting that he'll appear. He very well could. He probably will. But recreating grey pants and boots wouldn't really be the most difficult part of digitally rebuilding a man who's been dead for 22 years. And look, maybe they could just save money by having him appear as a low-res blue hologram. There, I solved your fictional problem. There's a whole lot of minor or secondary characters we could get also, R2-D2 and C-3PO, but I think they'd be well clear of this whole situation. We might, however, get Wedge Antilles, Biggs Darklighter, Porkins, a rotating roster of bearded British men that are just milling about. The possibilities are endless, and by endless, I do in fact mean limited. But what did you think of the latest Rogue One trailer? Is there any particular aspects of it that you're excited about? Do you think this will be a better Star Wars film than The Force Awakens? And of course, if there's anything of note that I've missed worth mentioning, you know, feel free to leave that below. Also, this Sunday, I'm continuing my weekly Loot Crate giveaway. If you're a subscriber and turn on notifications, you know, you can come back and check that out if you want. Also, every Monday on my podcast, The Weekly Planet, we get stuck into all the big news of the week. So obviously, this coming episode, Rogue One will be heavily featured. That's linked below if you want to come along for it. All right. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care.